my own background is in religious studies primarily, um, sort of a mix of uh, specializing in Buddhist studies and Islamic studies. Uh, obviously, my talk with John was much more on the, the Buddhist side of things, focusing in on, on Nishitani. Um, but yeah, I, I'd connected with John a, a couple months back when I organized a, a discussion between him and, and Tom Cheatham, who does does work on uh, Henri Corbin, uh, so more on the Islamic side of things there. Um, and uh, we, we'd also had a little bit of, of, of talk over email about Nishitani. As at the time, I was I was leading a, a discussion group uh, through Nishitani's religion and nothingness. Um, so yeah, I, I once John started up his his uh, Voices with the Reiki series, I figured I would reach out to him and see if we could dig into to this text, considering it was uh, such an impactful one for for both of us. Um, so yeah, I, our our discussion flowed really well. I'm I'm really happy with with how it went. Uh, as uh, I mean, just the the materials relating to Nishitani online, especially in video form right now are very, very specialized, uh, like, like grad students giving, giving various papers on like, uh, Descartes in, in Nishitani's thought uh, and how his interpretation is really colored by Heidegger or something. So very high level stuff that, uh, someone like just, just getting into the text would, uh, would feel quite lost, uh, trying to, trying to tackle. Um, so yeah, the the discussion with John, we really kind of followed the arc of the the text. Uh, really, not not very intentionally. It just kind of kind of uh, happened that way, which was interesting. Um, so yeah, it was it was really exciting to sort of cover these these different uh, concepts and at least be able to to introduce them to an audience uh, so they can dip their feet in a little bit and see if they might want to explore deeper with some of this uh, Kyoto school philosophy. That's right. Well, let me ask you, like what, what, you know, John has called this one of the three most influential books. You know, what makes a philosophy book that powerful? Like what is it about this book that, that you both revere so much? I, I think uh, just speaking for myself, it's, it's, how he's able to like weave together uh, different levels of of discourse so uh, excellently. Uh, I mean, this is certainly a, a history of, of philosophy text in in some important ways, in that he goes goes through various philosophical figures uh, and uh, levels critiques and shows how uh, interpretations have have sort of built on top of one another. But it's always also at the same time through that uh, speaking very pertinently to a, to an existential level of of our own experience and some of these uh, fundamentals that we uh, hit up against in in life uh, and and so it's I mean it's almost a paradox in that like my own uh, uh, students if you want to call them as we were uh, going through this text we're constantly wondering like what's what's the like pertinence of this what's like the practical value um and i, I saw that in, in some of the youtube comments as well uh but somehow uh even though it's 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 at this so abstract level uh there really is uh it it, it, it really speaks to to some of the the core and the depths of of human experience and uh uh yeah it it it, it reads it reads like a, a meditation in in a in a deep sense, uh, in a, in, and and sometimes as like a Zen koan, um, and just how he's able to to weave all those levels together and and state something profound and historical about uh, the developments in philosophy, while also like speaking like to you and in, in your own deepest being is 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 really really something unique. I haven't found in, in other philosophical works. Great. So I want to ask one more introductory question, then I'll pass it to, to others. But you, you talk a lot about nihilism and nihility in the talk. Can you just give us a definition of nihilism and nihility? Like... Yeah. Uh, the, the easiest way to perhaps conceptualize these things, uh, 
nihility especially is is just like the the finite aspect of of things the the aspect of like death and decay that is that always comes along with the the being the existence the the substance of a thing so i mean you can't have some object that also uh won't be uh falling apart in 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 some uh sense as it as it moves through time um so nihility really just refers to this pervasive aspect of experience that an existence that uh, uh everything is has it at its at its ground there there's not uh you can't find something that is uh not in some way uh connected to this nihility it's uh, like uh the as 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 death is to life uh, nihility is to to being um and so so nihilism is is really just the uh the personal psychological standpoint of uh uh really uh, being existentially aware of the this field of of nihility and being sort of caught in its in its grasp so to speak and a lot of a lot of the time we hear about we hear people refer to nihilism in sort of a derogatory or negative, you know, negative mm-hmm. way. Do you think it's intrinsically negative? Yeah, that's a great question. For Nishitani, it is definitely not intrinsically negative um, in that it is just uh, an aspect of, of existence like like being itself is. Uh, uh, but uh, the the human being staying stuck on the standpoint of nihility and nihilism that is uh, a, a limiting situation and and one which comes with with negatives um, so the progression through this this nihilism this field of nihility is is something that that ought to be undertaken uh, so that we get to the uh, integrated standpoint of, of shunyata or emptiness where uh, nihility and being Codependence and coexistence uh, are really, really allowed to to come forth, uh, both within our own uh, viewpoint, but also uh, through that, uh, like ontologically in in the world as well. This two twofold uh, uh, term of realization that it it's something that you apprehend personally, but it also becomes actualized in in the world there uh, as you apprehend it. All right. Well, thanks. So uh, let me turn it to to questions. So who who? So I'll ask people to you know just. I, I think it went well with uh, with John's talk. So you know, I guess sort of first come first serve. And if you hear someone talking, you know, maybe let them go first. I think we have few enough people that everyone should have have time to ask ask their question. So so go ahead. Who has a, who has something to ask? Don't be afraid. Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, I actually wrote out this question. I don't know if you saw it earlier or not. Um, But it is, why does Nishitani, um, I understand his criticism of Aristotle and substance, and I I Mm -hmm. sort of agree with it. But my question is, why is he going after Aristotle and not, say, Parmenides? Um, Is he getting, I think uh, Heidegger made more or less the same move. And I'm just wondering, did mm-hmm. Nishitani get it from Heidegger, or um, is there something else behind it? Yeah, that's a great question. I I would be inclined to say yes, uh, that this is a is a Heideggerian influence in his thinking here. Um, yeah, it, same same with uh, his reading of Descartes is definitely uh, indebted to uh, to Heidegger. Uh, in terms of why he makes that specific move. That is a good question. Um, I don't know if I know enough about Parmenides to give a particularly robust answer. Um, my my intuition is 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 perhaps just that uh, Aristotle's such a such a big name thinker, uh, and so many so much of Western philosophy really directly and indirectly goes back to Aristotle and has has built off of Aristotle. Um, and so even if he might not be the like pinnacle of of substance thinking in in the way that Parmenides might be, uh, he his impact with that uh, style of 
of philosophizing has been uh, very pervasive. And so the <clears throat> decision to, to go towards Aristotelianism, I think, has more to do with trying to speak to some of the very foundations of Western philosophical thinking, rather than trying to tackle this uh, idea of substance in perhaps its most uh, mature form, if that if that makes sense. Uh, because he, he weaves in a lot of ideas from different thinkers, uh, especially uh, in terms of like nihilism, nihility, or nothingness. Uh, he, he goes over Nietzsche, Heidegger, Sartre, uh, all, all in, in quite a bit of detail. And so um, really, really what he is trying to do is uh, look at the, the arc and the development of Western philosophical thinking and, and critique uh, where things haven't, uh, haven't lived up to, to his vision of, of emptiness or, or shunyata. Um, and Aristotle is one of the, uh, really foundational, uh, figures in, in terms of this arc that he's looking at. Okay. Thanks for the answer. Um, I, I might, as a candidate explanation, just offer the fact that we don't really have much of Parmenides left. Right. Um, you know, so People, we have fragments, but you know they say he, he was the first metaphysician. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the books that Viveki recommended, even you know what is this uh, Eric Pohl's book on on metaphysics, um, explicitly you know makes that claim. For example, um, yeah. Well, the, the one question that I would have then in that regard, I mean, we do have good records of Plato, for example, um, and. It, it, can you speak to how Plato would be different from Aristotle in terms of substance? Is that something that you're familiar with? Yeah, um, I, I'd say Nishitani is definitely more aligned with Plato uh, than Aristotle philosophically. Um, the The Platonic idea of form or eidos, uh, even though it's it's still a more of a being notion uh, of of what constitutes the uh, identity of a thing, it's it's not uh, it's not as materialized uh, in the, in the same way that that Aristotle's uh, substance vision is. Materialized might not be quite the right word uh, for this, but uh, well, well, it sounds to me like you're almost um, referring to the differences in realism because Platonic realism, you know, it was the general right. that was real, not the particular. Whereas yeah. with Aristotle, it was the individual. And well, mm -hmm. I, I kind of got like that kind of hint from the way that you and Viveki were talking to each other about um, Nishitani's emphasis on the individual, because mm -hmm. it, it, well, it sounds like there's a similar kind of um, tension going on there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just, just could, could I just ask you th though, for the benefit of everyone, can can you like define some of these terms as you're going through them, just very briefly, so everybody can sort of be on the same page uh, with with where you're at? Great. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> the the big term to to keep in mind here with Nishitani is that of shunyata. It's a Sanskrit term that is most often translated as as emptiness, uh, and uh, that's that's really at the the core of his his philosophy here. So this idea of uh, shunyata, uh, and then uh, in terms of the Platonic philosophy that we're kind of getting into now, uh, we have the notion of idas or or forms, uh, as that is often translated. Um, and Verveke talked about this uh, a couple times in his Meaning Crisis series. Um, but yeah, this is sort of the idea that there's uh, there's a there's a world of forms uh, uh, that's a, a metaphysical reality where uh, the sort of uh, ideal e essence of a of a thing is 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 realized so like you have the idos of of chair in this world of forms that is sort of the the archetype of chairness so to speak um and so in this in this philosophy uh of plato compared to aristotle you you have a uh i mean a more hierarchical uh vision of reality versus considering things more in their uh material particulars um and a thing is defined uh, not so much in terms of its its own substance or like materiality, but more in in relation to this uh, 
more intellectual uh, idea of, of a form or of an idos. So uh, in terms of Nishitani's critique, uh, Aristotle just, uh, he, he locates the, the being of things much more in this, in this materiality, much more in this, uh, particular, particularity, uh, in a way that, uh, that takes us away from, uh, meeting things on, on their own home ground, uh, so to speak in, in Nishitani's language there, where, as the Platonic conception here has has a little bit more of uh, of that uh, that ability left in it. Great, thanks. Does anyone else have a have a question? Just just go forward. I can bring up some other ones, or but. Okay, well, I'll, I'll throw out uh, another one. So, certainly, you know what? What does meaningless mean? So, as mm -hmm. conscious, intelligent beings, it seems to me that we're, we're sort of we have we're meaning generating by our by our nature. Uh, now, maybe not universal meaning in terms of you know the universe as a whole having meaning, but it it it, it seems that we always should have meaning if we're understanding each other. Uh, if, we're, if we have any kind of agent arena uh, concept, it, it, we seem to have meaning. So, so how do we have meaning? Uh, is meaninglessness just sort of mean, like I think John raised it as despair. I mean, that mm -hmm. I sort of get, but I, I don't really understand having no meaning. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's an that's excellent uh, avenue to look at this. So meaninglessness... Uh in Nishitani's conception is, is intimately linked with this idea of nihility. So nihility is, is that which nullifies meaning. Um, so uh, let's say, for example, uh, your, 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 your grandfather dies um, and this death, this coming of nihility uh, can, can definitely leads you into to this this sense of meaninglessness of of the the relationship you had uh, and and just like all all the potentiality that was there all that what you 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 hope for and how you idealized that relationship is it hits a it hits a wall uh with this this coming of of nihility uh but the important point here is that uh that's not the the end of the story for for Nishitani, uh, because he doesn't stop at this this perspective of of meaninglessness of nihility. Um, so when we're able to uh, soldier through the the nihilism, the nihility that has come forth in this life experience, we get to this point on the field of emptiness where uh, instead of trying to relate uh everything about our grandfather back to our own selves back to our own hopes wishes goals uh on this field of consciousness uh that we have and we've inherited this from from descartes really uh once we've gotten out of that mode the the meaning of uh, our grandfather's life and our relationship with him is able to uh arise codependently with its nihility uh, to to be encountered on its own terms uh, and on its own home ground is, is the language Nishitani uses a lot. Uh, so that that meaning is the meaning we initially have uh, on this field of consciousness, which is very linked and determined by the notions of being and substance that he is critiquing here as as only one side of the, the equation. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's real in a sense, but it's also uh, limited. And then when we get to nihility, that meaning is, is uh, transformed into meaninglessness. Um, but then this final uh, uh, conversion to shunyata is, is what uh, allows meaning to come into its, its real essence. And uh, it's, it's not an essence that denies nihility or uh, denies meaninglessness, but it's a 
it's a meaning that uh, is, is codependent on meaninglessness in a sense, almost. But so could, I mean, could you get could you give like a, a more like a, a practical example of that? Let, let's take the example <laughs> of the grandfather dying. Yeah. Like, yeah. so you have this life with this grandfather. I mean, you've had your moments, you've had your relationship. So obviously, there's meaning there. But okay, so so he dies. What are the thoughts that represent what you've just described? Mm -hmm. So the death itself would be uh, a, a sub subspecies of nihility. It's a it's a kind of nihility. The the being of this person has been nullified uh, by this experience of death. Their life is nullified. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that has a lot of a lot of consequences in terms of uh, how we are able to psychologically and existentially relate uh because we're very much in this in this mindset of uh meaning being fully dependent on 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 being or or substance um so it, i mean just in terms of how a, a grief would would naturally proceed um perhaps you would have a a sense of a, a deep regret that you weren't able to express something or weren't able to have fully taken advantage of of the relationship or that uh, you never were able to realize a certain uh, project you had together or something. So these these meanings there uh, uh, seem to be uh, nullified uh, through the death because this being aspect uh, that we had banked all of all of our meaning on has has uh, vanished through through death there, um, and so that's that's a very natural response uh, because of our our situation of having being and this this field of consciousness be uh, really the dynamic that uh, that we have in terms of uh, <clears throat> how we how we construct meaning and how we cultivate meaning. So then then finally getting to to shunyata. Um, we enter into a standpoint where it, it's it's incredibly hard to explain, uh, and I mean this is this is what a lot of people would probably criticize Nishitani for in terms of like what's the 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 practical value of 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 this conversion. Um, so I I I'm I'm not positive that I'll be able to quite do it justice uh, ad libbing here, um, but basically. Uh, you are able to recognize that uh, any any moment that you did have and any meaning that did arise uh, is it was already uh, like arising from the nihility uh, and already colored by this this meaninglessness. Yet it was actually the meaninglessness that allowed these meanings to arise in the first place. Um, it was the fact that your grandfather was this particular finite, limited person that, mm -hmm. uh, and, and also the fact that you were also this uh, particular finite, limited person who uh, was able to enter into relationship and, at all uh, and, and connect at all that, uh, I mean, those those meanings are in, in a sense uh, uh, more robust than than any nihility could could uh, undermine. Uh, they they did exist. They uh, will continue to exist, and uh, they're in a in a sense uh, almost uh, indestructible. Like once you once you get to a perspective that. Uh, that integrates the two uh, of being and and, and nihility, uh, and are able to see how the the meaning is is really this codependent uh, arising from from the both of them. That's that's when you're able to shift to this this deep sense of of gratitude for for the grandfather and for the relationship, and be able to. Uh, meet that on its own terms without trying to uh, change it anyway in, in terms of like uh, your field of cognition and like terms of evaluating it on uh, to the extent that it 
brought you pleasure or evaluating it on the extent to which you were able to achieve the goals you had for that relationship. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's a complicated dynamic there. And Nishitani himself does not get into a single <laughs> concrete example of this sort uh, in his whole nearly 300 page text here. Um, so yeah, I mean, you really have to wrestle with it and, and try and figure out some of these, these uh, dynamics on your own. What you said reminds me, like one way I've thought about value and meaning of a finite life is we, we tend to think sort of in economic terms, the more mm -hmm. rare something is, the more valuable we tend to, to ascribe it. So having uh, a finite life makes each moment that much more valuable. If, if we had an infinite life, each moment would be, uh, you know, relatively less valuable uh in in that is that right. sort of along the lines that nishitani is talking about it's 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 definitely consonant uh he i don't think he would ever put it that way um i think he's trying to to find an even deeper dynamic than than that and that and that's why he <clears throat> attacks things on these terms of uh descartes uh, cogito or uh, aristotelian notions of, of substance or also even some Kantian uh, ideas of this like subject object divide. Um, so he's really trying to, to hit at our, our like baseline philosophical inheritances here and, and show how these very things are, are what allows this uh, uh, entrapment of nihility to, mm -hmm. to take place versus uh, a much more, just natural uh, arising of things as they are uh, on their own home ground. Right. So that, that, that was yeah, go ahead. Um, so would you consider him a non-dual author? Yes, absolutely. Um, he... And that's why it's so difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I find Jeff Foster's book, uh, An Extraordinary Absence, uh, wonderful for a beginner looking into what a non-dual perspective might be. He has narrative where he's describing his own view of, you know, he's sitting on the couch, he's watching uh, a YouTube video, the door, he hears something, a knocking, he goes over, he's right there, he opens the door, he's in that moment and what happens and then he switches mm -hmm. to here, you know, so he really, that book I like a lot. Um, and, you know, these concepts that are true, you know, perhaps you have some work cut out for you because we need to be able to explain these to people, yeah. even at a sixth grade level, because it is true, yeah. but to have concrete examples, um, you know, it seems to me that, uh, and I haven't read uh, him, I, I don't want to read the other three books you guys or John did suggest we read first. And I'm wondering that book I, I posted, uh, the self of overcoming of nihilism. Yeah. Is that is that an easier book to read? I have not tackled that one, so I I, I can't comment with any sort of authority. Um, just just sc scanning over it, uh, it, it seems like a bit more of a uh, a philosophical treatise, uh, mm -hmm. and not not quite this this deeply. Uh, infused existential work uh -huh. that that religion and nothingness is uh but i i'm sure it it, it covers some of the the same ideas especially as as relating to to nihility um and nihilism. I'll, I'll give it a look and you yeah. know if, if if we all think about it we've had the experience uh he speaks of you know where we feel like uh the ground of beings pulled out from under us yep. and and yep. we have that lost it's a scary feeling. Nothingness is sort of scary, but then you pick yourself up and you start deciding what has meaning again, how you can look at your life in a different perspective. So you go to that, you know, jump off the cliff and you don't know where you're going to land and, and you don't know if there's a bottom down there or not, but you, but you get to a point, I know in my own times of that, uh, that you have to take that jump. Uh, and that was, mm -hmm the question that I, I had for you, um, I think about minute 26, 
you and John were speaking of uh, absurdity and uh, meaninglessness and how we have to, uh, you know, actually embrace that to go any farther, we have to experience the whole oneness of existence, which is mm -hmm. the nothingness and the incredible somethingness. And, you know, John gets talking about the suchness and the uh, thingness and all this stuff. And, and I get what he's talking about. But anyways, I wondered, you know, because you've been on this uh, exploration for a while, if you have any personal experience with the it is an existential process. Uh, you know, how do we surrender? I mean, our ego does mm -hmm. not want to let go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, a great question. Um, one one important point, I think, especially bringing in this this language of absurdity that is particularly relevant to the uh, 20th century existentialists. Um, yeah, he Nishitani levels a pretty uh, extensive mm -hmm. critique against uh, Sartre, uh, in I think it's chapter two, um, and and his existentialism. Um, he says he he gets a lot of things right in terms of the encounter with nihilism and nihility, and how uh, this is kind of the the ground for a, a freedom in a sense uh, mm -hmm. to to make meaning. Uh, but his critique is really that Sartre. Uh, is, is still really operating on this uh, Cartesian field of uh, cogito. So it's it's always still related back to the self for the self that uh, these meanings are that co come out of absurd absurdism. Uh, and so what Nishitani really wants instead is is to show that even even the self itself uh, it has nihility as its as its ground. And uh, it can't be taken as any kind of uh, fundamental center any more than uh, these things in the external. Yeah, in a way, world. it's yeah. not there. The yeah. self is not there. We've, mm -hmm. we've created this concept we have. Right. Uh, yeah, and as as a very Zen Buddhist thinker, I mean, he's 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 drawing on the tradition there of of no self in in Buddhism, and uh, but his exploration of it is is very novel in terms of how he weaves in so much of Western philosophical thought and integrates that. Uh, he's not just uh, rehashing some some Buddhist uh, talking mm -hmm. points or metaphysics in this domain. Uh, he, he really is doing something quite, quite unique. Uh, but yeah, it's one of his sort of explanations is that the self as as the self as we take it is is always like bound up within itself and it bases its value on itself and so this this sort of self enclosure of of the self is 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 actually one of the major uh sort of uh, points of nihility arising because we're we're not in this uh integrated flow with the world and instead uh always binding ourselves up within ourselves and trying to base our, our self and our life on this, this finite thing that we've uh, somehow taken as, as a, as a fundamental, that that's really where a lot of this uh, dynamic of, of nihility is able to, to come out from uh, since, uh, since if we, if we had this, this much more non-dual kind of uh, uh, basis for things, I mean, it's 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 there, you know. It's it's the world is is going through its its phases and 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 marching forth, and mm -hmm. that that's sort of un, undeniable and unstoppable. And so having having that basis, and we 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 would find a very different existential dynamic when when things like death and uh, finitude and and such arise within our existence, because it's it's part of this this world process just as much as the being and the existing of of things are so um yeah in, in terms of uh like more personal experience and and non-dualism i've not had the like deepest kinds of of non-dual experiences uh in terms of like meditative contemplative states um uh, but i one of the beauties of of nishitani's text is really how how visceral and and psychologically evocative it is so i mean even just just reading through it at a at a deep level like gets you in this intuitive state of of being able to 
if not experience these things, at least like sense their their possibility or their uh, their existence on on an existential level. Cool. Thank if you. I might, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> it's it's interesting hearing. Uh, some of this because of, uh, and I'm not sure I haven't read the text, but just trying to pick up on what I was able to, you and Verveke's uh, talk. Um, I've quite distinctly had the experience of, of entering into this kind of oceanic non-dual field. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it felt like um, well, quite quite accurately, uh, exiting the world of substance and instead kind of entering uh, almost this context, this web that kind of weaves through all the empty spaces between things and, and finding a deep sense of unity um, in that experience. And mm -hmm. and when I had it, it was kind of hoisted on me. It wasn't it wasn't right. through um, meditative practice explicitly. And <clears throat> It's interesting, right? I, I found that a incredibly um, transformative experience. This was quite a long time ago, probably when I was uh, twenty three or so. And what's interesting is I, I at a later date had another rather intense experience where it felt like I was entering into that oceanic field, but suddenly. Mm -hmm there was almost a, a realization that the peak of non-duality is to, in some sense, consent to duality. Like it's choosing yes. duality. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which almost allowed this, this... It felt like I was able to move into the egoic not as, a, not as an entrapment, but as a kind of delight in life itself. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, so I kind of have two questions here. One is that part of, I might also add, that brought me back to a more Western religious perspective um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of kicked me out of the um, perhaps wrongly uh, on, on my end stated goal of Eastern philosophies. Sure. Right? It might have been a lack of understanding, but... Um, is that part of Nishitani's work in that sense of kind of not so much entering into the non-dual field as a type of, uh, we might say, pseudo-telos, mm -hmm. but actually re-entering the dualistic? And then the other question I had is that you, you guys hinted towards his very deep respect for particularity, um, but I wasn't able to kind of grasp it in the conversation, how he was able to keep that deep respect within a non-dual perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your your intuition is is totally spot on here um, in terms of the, the kind of project Nishitani is doing and the kind of experience uh, that he's really hinting at. Uh, one of the unique languages he uses to describe this stuff is is the far side and the near side, and it's kind of related to like imminence and transcendence. Um, and so, on the on the field of of Junyata, this this final goal, which I mean, speaking of it as a goal, is already framing it in this field of of cognition. So we're already off, but uh, right. we can we can do that to 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 hint at, in the right right direction here. Um, but uh, the the field of shunyata he describes as the absolute near side. So it's it's the more of the near side to ourselves than the self itself. So when we are in ourselves and bound up in ourselves, as as we were describing, um, in, in some way we're we're divorced from ourselves because we have divorced ourselves from from this larger world nexus, as he he would call it, or uh, we've we've kind of bound up our dasein, our our being there uh, in ourselves, um, and so on. On the field of nihility, it's kind of this great equalizer where everything is like turned into a big question mark, uh, so to speak. The right. the everything's being is 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 
on this uh, shaky ground of, of nihility. Um, so that's this like far side where everything has sort of been alienated in a sense. Uh, and so what happens on the, on the field of Shunyata and what, what happened in the experience you described is, is returning to the absolute near side, like via the far side. We've, we've gone 360 degrees here around, around the circle and returned back to where we were, but in a, in a more expansive sense. Um, so, well, right. y- you definitely see people who have a, an intuition of, of non-duality or something uh, as being like very like transcendence focused and very like Gnostic or ascetic of like trying to, to deny particulars and leave the world right, behind right. and such. And Nishitani really, really rejects that kind of thinking. Um, and I, I nice. rightfully so, I think, because it, it gives no recourse for for like actually dealing with the <laughs> the considerations of life, which are still real and still uh, part of this world nexus as much as uh, we are or the external world is as well. Um, so in, in 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 that sense, he he really. I mean, the, the way he, he goes about this is he cr- creates a, a non-duality through particularity. Um, so speaking to the, the next aspect of your question here, it's, it's, he really looks at uh, individual things and each individual thing as being what allows this world nexus, this holistic world nexus to arise. Were it not for the deeply authentic relations between all things, you couldn't have this holistic unity arise. And if you didn't have a holistic unity, you wouldn't have particular things. They wouldn't have any any right. relationality uh, between themselves. So it's 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 held up on on both these ends and and mutually supportive. Uh, in this sense. And so that, that's one of the things that, that really struck me uh, about this approach to non-duality. It's, it's, it's really not a, not a naive holism or monism. Uh, it's, it's a much more integrated sort of uh, metaphysics or ontology than, than uh, well, it's all one. And then you just don't know how to deal with uh Right. <laughs> Any of these right. practical problems in, in life uh, and just <clears throat> regurgitate that response. That would be, uh, yeah, Nishitani would really uh, see issue in that. So. As a perhaps as a form of escape, naive escapism. Exactly. Exactly. When when you're when you're on that uh, on that sort of path, you're you're still in this field of consciousness and you're trying to to relate all other external things to this telos of non-duality rather right. than meeting them oh, on the, as they are on their home ground. Okay. So, and he still uses uh, shunyata to describe that state, which I also find interesting uh, just because again, in my own experience, it was kind of upon this realization of the motion through the non-dual back into the dual uh, I, I might even mm-hmm. describe it as a synthesis of that that void that is the the ground of being mixed with the fact of being itself that I saw kind of the reemergence of the Godhead, mm-hmm. although he frames it in the Shunyata. Would it, it perhaps be accurate to say that we are erring in those depictions on either side of a paradox? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I, the, I mean, Shunyata and its standpoint is, is inherently a very paradoxical place to be, um, where the opposites are always, uh, mutually dependent and, and mutually self-arising. Um, another important point in, in terms of some of the language you just brought up with Godhead is that. Nishichani draws pretty extensively on Meister Eckhart and uh, employs the term Godhead uh, uh, explicitly a number of times. And oh, interesting. Yeah, he sees Eckhart's uh, utilization of this term and how he explores it as 
uh, probably the closest uh, that uh, Western Christian thinking has 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 gotten to this standpoint of of emptiness in terms of its various theological uh, manifestations. So, right, yeah, right. I mean, Eckhart even talks, I think, uh, pretty explicitly uh, in, in some of the quotations Nishitani employs about sort of the nothingness of the Godhead or or how we become nothing in the Godhead and, right. and like the self realizes the Godhead in, in, in these uh, various ways. That's interesting because I've often kind of tried to create, or I don't know if I'm creating, describe a convergent point between Buddhism mm -hmm. and Christianity in that, in some sense, the goal of emptying the self is yes. is required within the West, or well, the Christian tradition, such that, right, it, you have to empty it all the way in order for it to be filled. And perhaps mm -hmm. the paradox is that mm -hmm. there is a filling. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, that that speaks really profoundly to to some of what Nishitani's outlining here. And uh, I mean, he's right there with you in terms of analyzing uh, Western religion along those lines as well. He he goes back to the the, the Greek term kenosis uh, to describe the the emptying of the self will of Jesus, uh, specifically like. Uh, on like through his life uh and devotion to god and how in the emptying uh it, it does have this fullness that that comes out i mean it was via the emptying of the self-will of christ that his he was able to embody divinity fully right uh, right in the exactly. in the western uh consciousness so yeah he he connects that as well to uh as like a ground for the idea of agape uh, as this non-discriminating, right. non-differentiating uh, lovingness uh, outpouring uh, is, is also really grounded in this, this idea of, of self-emptying. Interesting. Very cool. Thank you very much. That clarified a lot of points um, that oh, I was great. Playing yeah. Thanks there. for, thanks for uh, sharing your experience. Super interesting. All right, any other questions? Uh, and... Yeah, when I, 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 on that a little bit, um, I've got a quote here, uh, just to contextualize it. Um, this is an entry on differential ontology, and that stands in contrast to essentialism, which, uh, so it's essentialism, substantialism, uh, I, I, do you know how they, they linked it here? Um, essentialism and substantialism in, in Nishitani? No, no, in Western history. So, I mean, like Aristotle, he mm. didn't really make a distinction between substance and essence. They were pretty much synonymous as far as right. he was concerned. Right. right. Okay, so I just wanted to get that. So, um, this is a quote about uh, Gilles Deleuze as a differential ontologist, and mm. I will connect it in a second. Okay, so as early as 1954, um, Deleuze stressed the urgency for an ontology of pure difference, one that does not rely upon the notion of negation because negation is merely difference pushed to its outermost limit. An mm -hmm. ontology of pure difference means an attempt to think difference as pure relation rather than as not. And I was wondering, well, it touches on some of the stuff that Nick said, but I was also wondering, um, do you connect that up uh, with Indra's net at all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great question. I got to run for a bathroom break real quick, but I'll, I'll come back to your question in just a moment here. Which are, Jared, can I, we're, so we're coming up to an hour. I want to sure. be respectful of your time. Are you, are you okay to continue or what? What's, I, yep. What's My time afternoon is, is, is free for today. So I, I'm happy to continue on here for, for quite some time. So. Oh, great. All right. So great. Take a, take a break. <laughs> and that's great. Awesome. It's been a good uh, discussion. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Uh, Brett, did you, um, by any chance managed to figure out how we might go about recording on here? I haven't looked into that. I did not, but Tyler did. So we're, we're giving it a shot and, and awesome. hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll, it'll work. And, uh, then we'll figure out the best way to host it. Uh, glad to hear maybe, it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Th I think that's a good feature. We should try to record all these discussions and, uh, and I don't know if we'll host them to YouTube or 
uh, or just load them up on, I don't know, one of the file sharing sites. Probably YouTube is probably a good way to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> And and cool. and, and in these, record, like was... everybody can record, their, do their own recording too. Just to be to be clear, uh, you know, you know, there doesn't have to be the official recording. Uh, in the recording permitted channels, anyone can record. Go ahead. <laughs> Very cool. Likewise. Oh, Jared, maybe still AFK. Uh, he just stepped away for uh, for for a short second, but he's coming back. Yeah. But it, it, yeah, it's been a good discussion, and and yeah, and don't be shy about guys about you know about asking questions, and you know any any and all questions are are good, and everybody's at different levels. Uh, again, some questions will go over some people's heads and other, but you know, we want, but don't let that discourage you from asking, asking your own questions. Uh, if that's, if that's discouraging anyone, not, not that you have to ask questions, of course, but you know, all questions are welcome. Yeah, and it's interesting that he said uh, that uh, Nishitani doesn't focus on the practical. And and I find, you know, that sometimes can be an issue where we have a lot of these philosophical discussions which stay at very sort of high level and, and even sometimes poetic and very, dis, very uh, I, I don't like to use the word fuzzy, but almost fuzzy concepts that when we say, okay, but how do we apply this in real life become, you know, sometimes aren't quite as crystallizable and that that's something i think especially here we should be focusing on i mean in terms of if we're talking about the religion that's not a religion if we can't translate these things into practical lived experience then then we're gonna we're gonna be in trouble uh that, that that's got to be some some part of our focus i think jared jared's back All right. Hello. 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 Yeah. All right. Uh, could you read that Deleuze uh, or quote about Deleuze again, just so I'm on the right track with that one? Sure. As early as 1954, Deleuze stressed the urgency for an ontology of pure difference, one that does not rely upon the notion of negation, because negation is merely difference pushed to its outermost limit. So there's the connection between, well, negation mm -hmm. and nihilism, right? Right. Um, an ontology of pure difference means an attempt to think difference as pure relation rather mm -hmm. than as not. And that's the connection then that I would draw to end of net. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think. And, that, and if that's... you could just define, on, could you define ontology for everyone too while you're, you're going uh, through That's this? basically the study of being where uh, the original word, Greek word was ontos for thing. So mm -hmm. the distinction would be here between being and nothing. Mm -hmm. So the ontology, but uh, Nishitani says that both being and nihility are real. So it gets a bit dicey because mm -hmm. the, the generally yes. the ontologist would, would use the, the more Western notion of real, which Nishitani doesn't. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think uh, that works really well with, with Nishitani's uh, framework here. Definitely the idea of uh, negation as as sort of a parallel to to nihility here that it it sort of chopped things off like fully uh, in a way that is not what we're we're looking for as a, as a final standpoint um, and then also yeah the idea of uh, a relational ontology is 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 definitely huge in that uh, I think Nishitani might mention Indra's net once or twice explicitly but he's certainly 
describes something very similar to it multiple times, uh, especially when he talks about uh, the the slave and master dynamics uh, between all things. So uh, let's uh, say your radio well, is is the master of all things in the universe, but uh, at the same time, your radio is also slave to to all other things. So it's it's this deeply interconnected thing where uh, the, the being of one thing is always uh, uh, very interdependent uh, on the being and, and uh, of all other things. And it's nothingness and uh, emptiness that, that that dynamic is able to arise out of. Well, um, the way that I'm looking at it is that you see, it seems to me like Indra's net is an expression of relativity taken to its apotheosis. So mm -hmm. it is an expression of the relation as such, rather than emphasis on the absolute, where yeah. the absolute would be like the self-contained thing, the thing that is the yep. thing in itself. So that that's just like, I guess what I was trying to to get at is, is the notion of of nihility or or shunyata like relativity in that sense? Not not without necessarily the pejorative um, notion mm -hmm. that that West that the West has towards relativism as such. Mm hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. I'd say um, things things definitely aren't relativized uh, in 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 what you were saying as the pejorative notion. Um, but I, I things are also not uh, purely relational uh, in in like the the sense that uh, you can only ever define the the essence of a of a thing in its in its relationships uh nishitani definitely sees the dependence there uh and and how uh the the thing in itself on its own home ground is is a relationally interconnected thing in this world nexus um but i don't think he does away with uh, a, a a sense of in true individuality of of things as well um I don't think he uh, is involved in uh, what uh, Harmon and the Triple O people call overmining, where you uh, will reduce a thing to its its relationality. Um, it's one of the important Japanese terms that Nishitani employs is koto, which means like the meaning of a thing or the essence of a thing. Um, and it 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 really does impart this sense of genuine individuality uh through the particularities of uh these these relations um okay. but but uh, the individuality still stands in a sense yeah just quickly how would uh koto not be substantial then yeah that's a here let me let me see if i can can pull out a a quote here and in in this part of the text uh it's a little bit later i think it's in chapter uh five on shunyata and time um he he's citing a lot of zen poetry uh as sort of a a, a point of departure for examining this concept um so like he he has some examples with uh i mean this kind of nature association we have with uh, with some of the haiku form and such. And they're really deep readings of, of showing how the <clears throat> particular individuality of a thing arises through this sort of idea of a, of a world nexus. Um, but that uh, it's, it's not this, not this Western conception of, of a purely, uh, substantial existence because the the whole relationship of the the world nexus that uh allows things to come into being is integrative of this idea of nihility and and grounded on this field of shunyata so it really is the uh one of the metaphors he uses not metaphor but example uh that i brought up with john was uh 
the the fire that burns but does not burn itself and so this non self burning fire that's the emptiness aspect of the fire is uh is identified with this idea of koto um so it's it's not the the fireness of the fire but it's the non fireness of the fire that uh that uh imbues it with this uh individuality uh in a sense so that's that's where it departs from from this thinking of substance okay um so if i understand correctly the fire that the part of the fire that doesn't burn is in some sense unobservable but it's there is that right definitely yeah unobservable in in its own sense um but i mean we also do see a fire burning and not burning itself uh similar to how if we poured water into water we wouldn't see the uh the or we would wait <laughs> um, well we wouldn't see the water get wet example, i i can't see space but i can obviously see space you know right mhm mm perhaps the most uh direct and apprehensible uh uh version of this is is the eye which sees but does not see itself uh being being the nature of 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 sight vision and and our eyes um so yeah it's it's certainly a complicated dynamic uh nishitani would say that you don't really uh hit at the the non burning of fire if you're uh staying on this this field of of uh cogito and uh looking at things only through this being uh substance sense um but that on, on the field of chunyata this this aspect of things would 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 become uh clear in your existential uh approach and also in the like ontological reality Okay, thanks. That answers another question. Awesome. Anyone else here with uh, something to get? I've got another one. I just don't want to jump the... in. Tyler posed a question it. while you were away as well. That may be an interesting one if he's still around to ask it. Mm, yeah, I would definitely take that. He may he may have stepped away. Uh, Karima, you had uh, you had a question, right? Yeah, I do. Uh, I just you know wanted to let other people that haven't uh, spoken have a chance. But uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know, how things uh, happen very synchronistically. Uh, sometimes we notice, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't. Sometimes later we notice. Anyways, about 20 minutes before I got on this call, uh, I had. Uh, texted someone um and you know together when we use the g word we know we're talking about the equally you know 500 other names you can use for that <laughs> uh but uh i said uh i've been thinking about how to know i am doing god's will which mm. is a sacred adventure i do realize the will of god penetrating all substance and nature and that it can at least be reduced to the common denominator of love, life, and light. And then I said, uh, do I dare to think this very moment is the will of God coming alive in me minute by minute when I simply do the next step before me with integrity and love? And when you two were talking about uh, how this adventure of being human, we discover the, the eminence of that which is all and the transcendence into that which is all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea is we still continue to wash dishes and help our neighbor if they need groceries. So how do we merge the absolute and the relative is, is this whole game. But does uh, Nishitani speak of the will like whose will is it you know we can we can kind of tell by the effects in our life uh mm -hmm. you know what are if we pay attention to our intentions and our actions you know we kind of relate to it's maybe a 
a, a different or better or you know a nicely infused aspect of will. But uh, does he speak of uh, of that at all in his writings? Yeah, he he tackles will a lot, especially in the last chapter of uh, Shunyata and History, where he analyzes how so many different theories of history or standpoints towards history have have been based in this idea of will, whether it's the traditional uh, theistic conception of of God's will being the the driver of history or our uh, more enlightenment ideal of uh, of progress uh, stemming from human will as being a a driver of history, and then to uh, Nietzsche's idea of the will to power um, and uh, and his eternal recurrence, uh, which is his theory of of history that's sort of based on this idea. Um, Nishitani really wants to get past the idea of will altogether, in, in a lot of ways, uh, because he ultimately sees this as something intimately bound up in this idea of, of selfhood and, and self-consciousness uh, in, in a sense that uh, that doesn't really mesh well with this broader vision of this integrated world nexus, uh, this yeah, idea. You, of, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, in the end of your talk uh, an auto-theological holographic, a non-theological history. That was it. And then John said, what is the giver of paradigms? What gives Mm -hmm. the being that is not a being? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I don't know how to get around, you know, I mean, sometimes I think about this idea of will. Apparently I I have been lately. But uh, yeah, you had said uh, a... uh, you know, going from going into a more multi-dimensional view of history, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I mean, how do you explain who's driving the bus? You know, it's probably mm-hmm. all, everything. I always figure everything you can think of probably is happening in some way. So yes. we're all co-creating this existence, and yet, you know, there's other forces, powers. I'm not going to say what or define it, but you know, something goes on. I mean, when the moon's full, we feel something. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, but yeah, you were were mentioning that a non theological history, uh, and I was just wondering that's kind of what you're saying. He hopes we go towards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he. It's what he both views as the actual situation and what he thinks uh, we should take as a, a, a healthier, more proper uh, theory of history. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of uh, the will uh, bound up in the self, definitely. Um, but of course, uh, there's still going to be uh, action and happening and doing, uh, even on this this field of, of Junyata, similar to how he doesn't want to deny particularity uh, and wants to actually uh, see uh uh, non-duality uh, being dependent on particularity and vice versa, um, he 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 does still have a an idea of action, and uh, it's it's of course going to be an action of non-action, and uh, so we're going to have a teleology of of non-teleology as well. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's 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 a very complicated. Uh, I, I like uh, the butterfly effect, you know. Yeah. Like- a butterfly on this branch here wiggling its wings definitely affects something on the other side of the world, you know. Mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I see that in modern, you know, quantum physics is showing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the pertinence of that. Um, and, you know, just I remember when I first heard words like non duality and like, what is that? And is it the opposite of duality? And it's all so confusing, but I just think if it can be, you know, like I say, and I think, uh, uh, Brett said, we've got to get the, this truth down to, or, or, you know, sixth, eighth grade. That's what most mm-hmm, newspapers mm-hmm. are written at eighth grade level, you know. Right. So, uh, and, and it'll happen, but it has to kind of be digested and lived. And then, uh, you know, uh, it'll happen. We can explain it. But yeah, duality and non duality are not at odds. Uh, they include each other. It's sort of like the yin yang symbol. Mm. Like, what field holds that? symbol you know 
Mm. You just keep going beyond the beyond the beyond. And we don't worry about it so much. And we're never going to get it right. And we're never going to get it done because, you know, it's just how it is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Nishitani speaks a lot in terms of this uh, notion of field. Um, so that's that's pertinent language, uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that comes out of Heidegger to a degree uh, from the little Heidegger I've read. Uh, I mean, he, at least in the translations I've encountered, the word like region is, is strong. And that has a similar kind of connotation to uh, this sort of spatial idea of a, of a standpoint or a, uh, an arena in a, in a sense. So, um, but yeah, I mean, to, to bring it down to, to sixth grade level, uh, Nishitani basically says, uh, I mean, everything is coming out of this field of shunyata, of emptiness. Uh, and it's the emptiness that allows things to, to be how they are and to develop and to uh, relate and to uh, decay and uh, to have newness uh, and universality come, come about. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very all-inclusive uh, standpoint and field. I could just see one of those anime cartoons as you were talking right there. And, and, you know, if you watch something like that, you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that anyone else? Tyler, uh, I know. Yes, yeah, Tyler back. He had a, a question. Yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for recording. Yeah. Mm hmm Hmm. Sure. I'll, I'll tackle the, the first question first. Uh, I, I appreciate you bringing it onto a, to a personal uh, plane here. I think it's uh, yeah interesting stuff uh, and allows us to connect uh, beyond just this narrower intellectual or, or spiritual uh, mode here. So for me personally, uh, one of the most impactful uh, features of Nishitani's work here is, is the, the, the nature of his method uh, and the, the vision of, of his project. Uh, I mean, he's, he's drawing from uh, traditional Mahayana Buddhist sources. He's uh, widely familiar with Western philosophy and, and shows as much as he uh, talks about each of these figures. Um, but he's also deeply uh, invested in the development of Christianity and that religious system. And the way he approaches things isn't simply as uh, a Zen philosopher. Uh, pretty, pretty right off the bat in, in his text here, he makes it clear that he's not using this term shunyata out of any uh, sort of... Uh, esoteric loyalty to to Buddhism as a tradition, but simply because it is a, a, a manifestation of a, a deep truth. Um, and so, I mean, there's times uh, throughout his text here where he cites the Gospels, uh, not uh, as just a, a source to be analyzed, but as uh, an exposition of, of truth in the same way that he is employing this idea of shunyata. And so being able to uh, draw from, from these wide sources and be deeply discriminating uh, in terms of just finding truth in, in all these nooks and crannies of uh, human philosophical and theological thinking throughout history is, 
is very refreshing uh, compared to many philosophical and theological projects that are much narrower in terms of uh, sort of being grounded in in certain creedal presuppositions of what the bounds of a of a truth seeking project could be. Um, so just uh, and 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 out of that like comes this this vision of uh, of uh, religious truth being much more accessible and uh, pervasive than uh, than we we would often think in terms of the 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 religious truth being a something that's just merely given by a, an, an institution or or something of the like. Um, so yeah, I I find a lot of inspiration uh, in in the nature of that project, and uh, I mean it certainly connects very readily to this idea of the religion that's not a religion, uh, being able to to draw deeply from these various uh, sources for religious ends uh, and philosophical ends, but not uh, not be bound. Uh, by by certain orthodoxies or or creedal presuppositions but on the on the flip side it also not be uh engaged in a in a merely cherry picking or uh idealizing uh project of just uh throwing a bunch of things together that uh that you like and trying to to build a a, a self suited philosophy out of those uh i think anyone who reads Nishitani's book will probably not see that as as his his project here even though he is drawing from from multiple uh, traditions and sources here so i i hope to to be able to do similar cross religious trans religious type of uh thinking in 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 my own life and work uh especially with uh, the islamic tradition and and the western tradition and maybe some Buddhism as well. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a big personal uh, inspiration here. What? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have not read it. I know it is a, a well loved uh, book and uh, w recommended by many people I I trust. Uh, so, I <laughs> I have a, I have a general idea of what uh, what the content and style is. Mm hmm. Hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Nihility is, is, uh, impermanence is, uh, an aspect of nihility or, uh, uh, a, a kind of nihility, um, in that it is this like, uh, represent representation of finitude through time. Uh, these things are, are fading away as as they move through existence um in terms of uh nihilism uh we have our encounter with impermanence uh s triggering uh because of our our various uh presuppositions and uh uh human reactions to such things uh triggering a, a, a nihilism in in our in our consciousness as a as a result so the important thing is that uh, it's it's both this like ontological reality and also a, a psychological existential one. Uh, so the nihility is the ontological side, 
um, the nihilism, which Nishitani doesn't use as often. He talks much more of nihility than nihilism. Um, yeah, the nihilism being the, the much more uh, existential psychological aspect. But they're, they're definitely intimately relink- linked. Um, an encounter with nihility is likely to produce nihilism in, in the uh, historical philosophical context of these various inheritances we, we've gotten from, from Western philosophy and theology. Um, but uh, uh, the nihilism that exists doesn't mean we are uh, uh, forced to abide in uh, the nihility that exists doesn't mean we're forced to uh, uh, take up nihilism as our, our final abode. Uh, it is this it is this in between that we're meant to to uh, pass through on the on the journey to this uh, conversion to shunyata. Mm. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. That, that is an excellent example, I'd say. Uh, yeah, I mean, looking at it from this uh, idea of the, the field of, of cognition, uh, I mean, the, the young child is so bound up uh, in their self-centered idea of, of their, their mind that when something is, is removed from their immediate sense perception, they fall into this trap of thinking it... it uh, was completely destroyed or uh, nullified, uh, and uh, likewise, that's that's what we are also doing, uh, bound up in our own uh, self consciousness. Uh, when something is uh, removed or nullified from the bounds of what we take our, our our consciousness to be, that's when we hit up against that nihility. But that isn't uh, just just as in the case with the child. That's not a a truly objective process. It's it's really grounded in this. Uh, how, it's grounded in the extent to which we've limited our approach to reality to our 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 field of cognition. Hmm. Mm. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I liked the way you used impermanence of impermanence there. Uh, one of the ways uh, Nishitani describes shunyata and the, the field of shunyata is the nullification of nihility. So nihility is this great nullifier, but uh, even nihility itself is, is swallowed up in the even deeper void of, of shunyata or absolute emptiness here. Um, so, I mean, e even if we just think about it, like uh, when we fall into nihilism, it it's always uh, nihilism for us. It's because we can't find the meaning in something. Uh, but we're, it, and so the, the nihilism is, is, is still this like uh, thing that's caught up in this representational process of the self. And so it's, it's emptiness here that is able to swallow up that, that whole dynamic. Um, and uh, I mean, then when, when you remove the, the, the self from this dynamic of, of nihility, there's no nihilism left to be found uh, because there's uh, no self bound up in itself to relate uh, nihility back to. And so it, it loses its uh, ultimate power in a, in a sense there and things can go on being things because i mean they they certainly are i mean there's still things even when you're when you're nihilistic and there's still meanings that arise uh so those are allowed to return to this absolute near side uh where they really have their original existence to begin with i wonder if i could ask a question that pulls off from what you just said um yeah so, so thinking of the nothing, the no thingness of the self. I mean, I think of it as the self being a process, right? That you know, you know maybe mm. a process of the brain, uh, but it, and so it's not a thing in that sense. But, it, but in a very real sense, at least when we come to physical things, everything is a process. You know, they're mm. all made up of moving particles in relation to one another, and I guess the difference between like a process like like thinking or a process like uh, you know with the machine is that you know the relationship between the particles you know is not in a, you know the pattern varies whereas in a thing the pattern stays more constant but mm. but I, I i it just seems that there shouldn't like should we really be that uncomfortable with the self being a process if everything is a process mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean that's a that's a good point. Uh, Nishitani doesn't directly talk about the self as a process in quite the same way. Um, it's definitely consonant to some degree with his thinking. Uh, I'd, I'd say that uh, there's 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 a, still a sense that uh, that things can't be reduced to to process. He doesn't want time to sort of swallow up. Uh, things uh in a, in a so to speak um but yeah i mean in in the introduction uh to religion and nothingness uh i think it's winston l king who wrote that uh he, he mentions uh whitehead uh as as this process uh theologian process philosopher as being one of the the thinkers uh in in the 20th century who probably came closest to, to some of nishitani's ideas here so yeah i mean there's there's certainly uh points of, of of convergence there if i might jump back a little bit briefly to was that satisfactory brett i didn't mean to interrupt yep 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 go ahead okay. um <clears throat> uh if i might jump back briefly to your personal uh value that you found in Nish nishitani here and what you kind of outlined as some of your project uh i found some similarity um mm. uh, our, our little beverage group had an, an interview with verveki and uh, one of the things he kind of exploratively proposed was this idea of a dynamic um perennialism and it, it kind of contrasting that to I, I don't have a better word for it so i'll just say the naive or perhaps propositional uh, perennialism 
that mm-hmm. kind of arose in earlier philosophers, say in the the fifties with the uh, or sixties with the initial onslaught of uh, East meets West philosophy. Um, I guess my question would be: Would you say that this dynamic perennialism would be a accurate description of what you're hoping to find there and in what way do you think nishitani offers a pathway to that if so Mm -hmm. that was not Mm -hmm. found in the earlier forms yeah uh great question absolutely uh i i actually uh have a a, have a strong background in in perennialism it was uh my my thesis topic in in undergrad so i i do have some some uh robust uh uh, experience here that I can bring to bear on this. So, uh, what is called perennialism, or often also called traditionalism, is a modern religious philosophical movement, m- often considered to be started by Rene Guénon, uh, a French thinker who uh, was an initially interested in in the occult, uh, but then moved more in the direction of traditional religion. He eventually uh, came to convert to Islam and moved to Cairo, where he uh, lived out the rest of his life. Uh, He influenced a lot of other thinkers, uh, the most important being Fritjof Schuon, who uh, was also a prolific writer. And the two of them are probably considered the, the... most uh, influential and, and prolific of the perennialist authors. And both of them uh, uh, ended up converting to Islam, um, uh, both Europeans initially. Uh, Fritjof Schuon was from Switzerland. Um, and so uh, a lot of times people associate perennialism with Aldous Huxley, um, but it was, a, it was a movement that started uh, long before Huxley wrote about it. And this, uh, this core movement uh, that traces back to Gainon and uh, Shuan here is actually pretty critical of, of Huxley's uh, <clears throat> uh, own, own thinking of, of perennialism and, and think that he misses some, some important points. Uh, so in terms of how Nishitani compares to, to these, uh, this particular perennialist movement, he definitely differs uh, in in some important ways. He is more of a a philosopher and an existentialist. Uh, The traditionalists are pretty interested in uh, upholding orthodoxy and uh, the institutions Mm. of orthodoxy within traditional religion, even though they're much more focused in on the esoteric side of religion than the esoteric side. Yeah. But uh, they they definitely see uh, immediate necessary value in the exoteric. Uh, and so in terms of uh, sort of coming up with very novel interpretations of, of doctrine, uh, they at least profess to be uh, against such things, so they they would see some issues with how Nishitani is is uh, just kind of giving his own interpretation uh, of 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 certain things, especially within Christianity, as someone mm. uh, grounded in in Buddhism. They are also, uh, despite strongly affirming this idea of the the unity of of religious messages and the idea that uh, our our world religious traditions. Uh, at least up through Islam, uh, are authentic divine revelations, which have their own uh, genuine spiritual paths and sacred law that uh, can lead to both uh, worldly enlightenment and uh, uh, salvation in the in the hereafter. Um, but uh, they they they're quite uh, anti syncretist, uh, at least in their in their writings. So when Nishitani is bringing in uh, he, he almost wants to, to Buddhize Christianity uh, and, and bring some of these uh, ideas of emptiness into the Christian system. Uh, that nice. would be something that the perennialists would uh, likely oppose. Uh, they would 
respond that the Christian system is already full and complete and self-sufficient and to try to import a, a metaphysical framework from an, another religious system would be okay. to sort of throw it off balance or, or uh, throw it off kilter. Um, right. So one is almost seeking kind of a balance through synthesis in Nishitani, and the other is almost looking at each system as a complete representation, yeah. all aimed towards the same message. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the, the big metaphor of the perennialist school is the, the multiple paths up the mountain. You can uh, be a mountain climber and you can uh, choose any number of different trails and still reach the summit of the mountain. Uh, and the fact that you took one trail and not another doesn't negate that the other trail takes you up the mountain. Right. Um, and so the, the perennialists view the various world religions as these sort of divinely given trails that have been established and well-trodden uh, so that one is able to uh, really follow the trail and get to the destination. Whereas Nishitani's method here, uh, to, to play off the same metaphor, is much more uh, to sort of find your own way up the mountain existentially and to perhaps uh, take inspiration from various other trails, but to ultimately see them winding around on the side of the mountain in uh, ways that are unhelpful and unnecessary. Right. So right. he really wants you to be able to uh, struggle up the mountain yourself to avoid just getting stuck on a winding trail uh, and not right. being able to get there at all. Would you say that it's fair to describe that difference as more deeply rooting it in phenomenology? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> hmm, hmm, phenomenology. Perhaps, uh, perhaps existentialism slightly more, uh, and particularly Heidegger's uh, philosophy. The, the traditionalist authors don't really profess to having been inspired or drawing from any modern philosophical thinkers. They really are only, uh, or at least they claim to be only drawing from uh, traditional theologians of varying religions. Um, the, the, the school as a whole is, is really anti-modern uh, and sees modern philosophy and modern world as highly decadent. Um, right. So that's going to be a big difference uh, right off the bat uh, between Nishitani and, and, and these thinkers is that Nishitani is absolutely drawing from Heidegger, Nietzsche, uh, and, and such figures, uh, often, often to uh, show where they haven't gone far enough, um, but also definitely to some degree in debt to, to the contributions they make where uh, the, the traditionalists or the perennialists would, would not draw on such authors or at least not consciously so. I have heard that uh, the thinking of the school is at least somewhat rather indebted to Kant uh, in a way that they don't acknowledge. But uh, right. yeah, so uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, Nishitani, uh, you, you could use the term perennialist to describe him perhaps in a very, very loose way. Uh, but uh, in terms of how he aligns with the historic school, uh, not not much uh, really at all, I'd say. Right, right. That's great. So Yana, Yana posted uh, posted a, a song from Adventure Time uh, that Yana thought was was relevant. Did you want to say a little bit about why what you like about it and what you just why you shared it? Uh, I uh, can you hear me? First yep. of all? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, uh, it's actually to uh, a little bit earlier in the conversation, uh, but I think it's better to just listen to it and then get out of it what you like mm. first. Uh, but I guess, yeah, uh, it's, it's not for right away. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 I've, I've heard some of the, the music from that show and it's kind of, 
kind of wild how how deep and uh, emotive it is for ostensibly a, a, a children's show. So I, I've, I've definitely had it come up in in similarly spiritual and philosophical discussions before. So I'm I'm sure it uh, has something to to add here. So uh, uh, is, I, is there, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was just going to ask if if anyone who hasn't asked a question yet uh, wanted to ask one. But if mm-hmm. but continue answering. Answer yeah, I can question. I can probably take like uh, one or two more questions if if people had them. My my voice is is, is reaching the end of its uh, stamina here. So, <laughs> oh, it's been great. We really appreciate this. So, is, is there anyone first who who hasn't asked a question yet who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Is, is there anyone who has asked a question who wants to ask one last uh, one last Me. question? <laughs> go ahead um yeah it's actually quite a short one i don't know maybe i had a i lost time for it but maybe you inadvertently answered it i don't know um my question is okay so nishitani he has being and nothingness as as real so what is mm-hmm. the opposite of real to him um that's a good question yeah so he uses the term illusion occasionally um and he's really drawing on Dharmic philosophy here. Uh, and I think he does actually relate it to the, the term Maya out of, out of Hinduism uh, and Buddhism as, as this illusion. Um, but like everything, uh, these opposites of realness and illusion are, are mutually dependent uh, and mutually created and arising. So uh, when things appear to us on our our field of of cognition and we uh, relate to them solely through means of substance and uh, uh, relating back to ourselves, uh, there there is an aspect of illusion in there since uh, we have dramatically limited the the scope of that encounter. Um, due to uh, it being really bound up tightly in 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 this uh, process of of uh, understanding ourselves as as uh, these cognitive agents divorced from from the world uh, in such a way um, yeah so uh, in terms of non-reality uh, I'd say it definitely goes back to this uh, this, idea of maya from from buddhism um but he he doesn't really want to to make the world into an illusion uh in in an aesthetics or gnostic sort of sense he he wants a really deeply real contact to to be able to to come to the to the fore in that and <clears throat> i think this is where he kind of departs from a lot of traditional buddhist thinking is I don't think he even really would say the the self is is fundamentally an illusion. Our our conception of the self and our our attachment to the self is an illusion. Um, but uh, like any other entity, it the self is is this thing that is uh, uh, codependent on on all other things and derives its its reality uh, from them. So I, which is it's not necessarily an unBuddhist. Uh, conception of it in terms of it being this codependent origination in a, in a highly causal sort of system that is uh, at the basis of the self but uh yeah the, the idea of a of a of a real selfhood is 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 there in in nishitani in, in an important way so okay thanks for the answer yeah right, so maybe i could close with one last question related to how we should approach an author like this from a lay person's point of view. I mean, not everyone has a philosophy degree. Uh, not everyone is deeply embedded in all the, you know, the, the three or four books John said you should read before <laughs> even thinking of reading this book. You know, so how should a lay person approach whether deciding to read these books or mm-hmm. how to get something out of it without, you know, we all have limited time and no, yep. most people can't just, do a philosophy degree now, <laughs> you know, right. even in a uh, sort of uh, an autodidactic way. So, 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 so first, how should we approach it? And if there's sort of a key practical point 
that you think a lay person should take from this work, mm -hmm. what, what would it be? Yeah, in terms of approaching it, uh, I mean, you certainly could just try and uh, throw yourself at this work without, uh, without uh, all the all the background knowledge. I, I certainly didn't didn't come to this having a super deep knowledge of, of William James, for example. Um, so, I mean, you can still definitely uh, get there, even if you don't have all the, the puzzle pieces in place. Um, in terms of practical suggestions for reading it, if you do want to do it, I'd say take it a little bit at a time. Uh, don't try and read a, a whole chapter in, in one sitting. I really wouldn't recommend uh, more than 10, 20 pages in a sitting. Um, and the other thing I'd recommend is uh, to, to find some some uh, friends to, to read, it, read it along with you and uh, to, to discuss it as you go. I think that can make up for a lot of our own individual uh, lack of expertise and, and lack of uh, comprehension of some of this. Uh, so just being able to discuss it through uh, and, and reinforce some of our comprehension and, and get new comprehension, definitely. I mean, I, I, I'm, I have no doubt that uh, uh, reading this with other people uh, made it w much more comprehensible than it would have been if I just tried to go through this, this text on, on, uh, on my own. And then the, the other thing is just uh, don't be afraid to, to use some secondary sources. Uh, the, the one book I mentioned is a series of essays uh, directly relating to religion and nothingness, trying to uh, unpack various aspects of it. So that's definitely helpful. Um, but there's a lot of stuff on on Google Scholar, on academia.edu, which uh, is, is should be accessible. So I, I, I probably have like a, a digital library of like 30 or so articles of uh, various things relating to, to Nishitani here. So it's, it's, it's out there if you, if you are looking for a, a really specific uh, uh, aspect of his thought, like people are, people are writing about it. It's, it's pretty confined to the ivory tower of academia. But uh, if you, if you have your, your various inroads uh, for traversing uh, such a space, uh, you can, you can get, get what you need to get. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of uh, reading it with other people, I'm really thinking of doing another read through of this text come this fall. Uh, if anyone would be interested in coming along for that, uh, just because I am sure I'd get something more out of it still. Uh, and uh, it would it'd just be good to, to have some of those discussions uh, continuing. So that yeah, sounds feel wonderful. Yeah, feel free to maybe, maybe we could here. even do it do it here on the on the forum. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah, it could that, be that a serious be, yeah, that possibility. Great. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Well, thank you, Jared. This has been great. Uh, thank yeah, this you. Was super uh, fun. <laughs> yeah, no, we really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone who asked questions. Uh, so Tyler's here. Tyler did the latest voices with Verbecki, and we're gonna be talking about scheduling a similar uh, Q and A uh, discussion. Awesome where we can talk about uh, his and maybe maybe make this sort of a series where we follow up Voices with Verveki with uh, discussions with the authors. And Monday, everybody, at 5 o'clock Eastern time, John Verveki is going to be here in the forum doing another Q&A. So everybody, please, please come back for that. And uh, yeah, thank, thanks, thanks so much. And thanks, Tyler, for recording. Today, we'll find a way to get it accessible to everyone, and I'll, we'll post it in, in, in due course. Wonderful. Thank you yeah, so thank much, you. Jared. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone for the questions and engagement. It was super, super eventful and and uh, uh, just great to connect over such uh, topics. So yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. And and now we can go back to just normal chat. Uh, you don't.